I'm Kate Atherley and I'm NITI's lead technical editor and this is the techniques column for NITI. This one's a little bit different. The topic is yarn substitution, something we've been talking a lot about recently online and it's a super conversation to have. Because there isn't a technique to show you, I'm going to do this one differently, taking advantage of the capability of Zoom to let me show you a PowerPoint presentation. I want to show you some slides. The crux of this is all about reading the information that's in the Nitty pattern that helps you make a good yarn choice to make a good substitution. So I'm going to be talking about what information is in the pattern, what it looks like, and how to use that to help you. Let's go. We're here to talk about yarn substitution. Well, I'm here and you're there. This is the virtual world, but let's talk about yarn substitution. This is really, really important. And this is how you really take the next step as a knitter to be able to customize projects to be exactly what you want. We're doing things a little bit differently now than we used to, and it's good. How the yarn specification used to appear in patterns was very much tied to how and why patterns were published. It used to be that patterns were for the most part published by yarn companies because they were a tool to sell that specific yarn. So this is a uh, just a picture from a, a sock knitting pattern that I've got in my library back here. And it says not particularly helpfully, three ply beehive fingering patronized. That's all it says for the yarn. It doesn't give you a heck of a lot of information. I don't know what the fiber is. I don't really know what the put up is. I don't have a sense of, I mean, three ply, if you're familiar with old yarn information, that gives you a sense of how thick the yarn is, but this is really not all that specific. It's tied so closely to that brand because that's what the objective was with those patterns. It was about selling that yarn. But that's not how we do things these days, which is super. And especially with a publication like Nitty, that's not how we do it because we're not tied to, we aren't a yarn company. We're not tied to a specific yarn company. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute because there is still a relationship, but we do need to address that. Let's look at how we show yarn information in a nitty pattern. What you get is you get the name of the yarn, the brand and the name. We give you the fiber information. We give you the put up. That is how much yarn there is in what quantity. So in this case, it comes in 100 gram skeins and you've got 217 yards in that 100 gram skein. And this is a color work pattern. And, so, and I chose this one deliberately because it's a smidge, it looks a smidge complicated. There are four different colors used. And for each one of those colors, you've got the quantity specified. For three of them, the quantity differs for one of them, the quantity is the same across all sizes. That's not the only yarn information in the pattern. We're used to looking for the heading yarn and it's like, oh, okay, so that tells me what I need to know. There's a lot more in a pattern that tells you about the yarn. The picture tells you about the yarn. I mean, it tells you the colors, tells you how fantastic it looks, but it also tells you more than you might be aware of. And the gauge information tells you about the yarn as well. And these are all standard tools that you should use that you can take advantage of to help you make a good yarn substitution. And they're all incredibly powerful on their own and take them together. This is the key to unlocking making a project exactly what you want it to be. When making a yarn substitution, you need to be able to identify five things. You want to be able, able to identify the thickness of the yarn, the fiber, the texture, the coloring and the quantity. I'm going to go through every one of those to show you what the clues are, what the information is in the pattern. Okay, but we'll say this. The closer you can get to the original, the more like the original thing photographed your project will be. That makes sense, right? Okay, you don't have to use the original yarn. It might not be available to you. It might not come in colors you want to use. It might not be at a price point that you can afford. It might not be appropriate for your particular requirements in that it might be a hand wash only yarn and you're looking for something super wash. It might not be a fiber blend that you like working with. There's a whole bunch of reasons, really 
good ones why you can't or don't want to use the yarn suggested in the pattern and that's good and again it's part of the fun of knitting honestly it's very rare that i knit something with exactly the yarn specified sometimes it's simply not available i have a lot of books behind me and they were published many of them were published years ago that vintage sock pattern for example published years and years ago and those yarns may not be available anymore so what we want to do is learn how to identify a yarn that you can get access to that is appropriate to your budget and your needs and your taste and even if I use I'll tell you the yarn that's exactly specified in the pattern it's a it's a rare pattern where I use the color specified I'm always adjusting the color and that's part of the fun right yeah so let's talk through all of these when you're looking at the yarn information, the first thing we want to be able to identify is known variously the thickness, the weight, the gauge of the yarn, okay? Some, some clues for you here in the information, of course, the yarn itself, okay? And this is where the internet becomes incredibly handy because what you can do, or the experts at your local yarn shop, you can look up that yarn. So if you're a user of Ravelry, you can look it up on Ravelry, you can look it up at the at the company's website. In this case, Lorna's Laces, go look at it on their website. There's a website called yarnsubs.com, which can help as well. So look up the yarn online, ask the experts at your local yarn shop. The gauge information, is a clue to the thickness of the yarn as well. And in fact, it's a really important clue. We tend to talk in thicknesses. We, use, we throw around words like worsted and DK and fingering and lace, but those actually aren't specific enough to help you choose a yarn, okay? You need something beyond the name because there's gradations of thicknesses. The stockinette gauge can be presented in a number of different ways on the yarn labels. Uh, very Euro European yarns often use this charming little graph. I really like it. It's nice and clear. It gives you a sense of the needle size, gives you metric and imperial, 20 stitches. Sometimes you'll see an M. That's the French M for my, but that's still stitches, 20 stitches, 23 rows. You might see it listed as 20 stitches in four inches or the number of stitches in one inch. You might also see a word, just worsted, DK, or you might see one of these numbering systems, one of these little skein logos with a number in it, medium weight, for example. These are a great start when you're shopping for yarn. Uh, the more precise, the better you're going to do in terms of accuracy. The words can be a little bit problematic and these numbers can be a little bit problematic in that they're not super precise. You can have a number of different yarns that fit into these categories because these are categories. What I do is when I'm shopping is I use these as a guide to get the right yarn. Reading the labels, I use these as a way to identify what corner of the yarn store I want or which bin over there I want to dig in to see what yarn I've got that fits this category. So I find the right yarn and then I'll swatch to make sure that I'm using the right needles. And that's what swatching is about. By the way, I'm not gonna, big, no big lecture here. Swatching is simply making sure that you're using the needle that is right for you to get the, the fabric that the pattern needs, that's all. Once you've got the right yarn and it's yarn where you're lining up the stockinette gauge, it's just a case of assessing to make sure you've got the right needles. You might not knit the same way as the designer. That's all. Okay. Now, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you don't match gauge, all of these warnings, right? If you don't match gauge, the piece won't be the right size. You could run out of yarn. Your fabric will look different. Your fabric will behave differently. How about this? If you do match gauge, the piece will be exactly the right size. You will absolutely definitely not run out of yarn. If you've ever run out of yarn on a single skein project, by the way, it's because it could have been a gauge issue. Your fabric will look exactly right and your fabric will behave exactly right. It will be drapey or it will be cuddly and warming exactly what you need it to be. When you're shopping for yarn, you've matched 
the thickness, you've identified the weight of the yarn you want. You also want to consider the fiber because the fiber can have a huge effect on the project. Uh, this project, for example, the stranded color work, I'm going to want something pretty specific to make that color work look good to be able to smooth that out and tidy it up with a little bit of washing and blocking, wet blocking. I will look at the yarn information and see if we've got any information about the fiber put up. And when I'm looking at a pattern, I always like to make sure I'm hoping it's identifying what the fiber is. Or again, we've looked the yarn up, but also look at the pictures because the pictures will give you a clue about what you want from the fiber. If it's a baby sweater, that's going to be a clue that you're going to want something that's easily taken care of, probably machine washable, potentially a synthetic fiber or a cotton, something that, that's good on the baby's skin. Or uh, I look at this and I'm going to want a wool probably to be able to smooth out that stranded color work. If it's a delicate shawl, I'm going to want a delicious soft fiber that again, perhaps a luxury fiber that will be able to take a stretch wet blocking. Various projects, the picture themselves become a clue. If it's mittens, I'm going to want to use a warming fiber, for example. So the fiber becomes a huge piece of the substitution puzzle. Again, best chance of success, matching like for like. So look at the fiber information, of course, in the yarn itself, but also look at the picture to get a sense of what you need. On fiber substitution, of course, there's lots of good reasons why you might need to change fibers. Ease of care, as I mentioned, fiber sensitivities. If I'm making for a baby sweater, I'm not going to use a scratchy wool. Your budget and fiber availability, absolutely. And these are all really good reasons why you might want to change fibers. In general, my advice is match like for like as much as possible. Okay. If you're not someone who's able to wear wool or you're knitting for someone who doesn't wear wool, then a pattern that's designed specifically for a woolen spun, very traditional woolly wool is going to really be key to the properties of those fibers. If you're wanting to make a cotton sweater, find a pattern for a cotton sweater. Okay. If you want to make a lace shawl out of silk, find a pattern for a lace shawl that's made that's designed with silk or a silk blend rather than a pattern for a shawl made with linen because different fibers behave, behave differently. Or if it's budget, if it's about fiber sensitivity, it's about, if it's about ease of care, a blend is often a really good way of doing it. If I'm making a sweater for a baby or a small child, I'm maybe not going to use a pure wool. I'm really fond of some of these 50-50 wool and cotton blends or do even wool and synthetic blends because they reduce the price point, they make them feel a little bit better and they're absolutely machine washable. Next factor is texture. Texture, how do we figure out what the texture of the wool is? Look at the wool of the yarn, look at the yarn itself, of course. Is it smooth? Is it fuzzy? Is it a boucle? Is it hairy? Look at the pictures too, they become a clue, right? And in this, again, I, I'm probably, chances are with this sweater, I'm gonna want something pretty smooth. This would look funny in a really funny, fuzzy yarn because it would hide all that beautiful, uh, beautiful color work that you've done. So use the pictures and the yarn information for, for the texture. And I will just, this is a cautionary tale. I had a brilliant idea about doing cables in a textured yarn. And I think you can see pretty clear here, the answer is not worth it. So if it is a very textured pattern stitch, the smoother the yarn, the better it's gonna look. Okay. Coloring, similar answer here, actually. If it's very busy, the if it's a busy pattern that is in that when i say it's busy i don't mean that in a bad way i just mean there's you know color changes going on here i'm going to want something that's solid or closer to solid i think this lightly variegated yarn is actually super in the solid sections of the garment i think it works really really well and again look up the yarn to get a sense of the coloring and another cautionary tale this was a brilliant plan to use a um 
variegated yarn for lace yeah no not so much so again same rule the more complicated the yarn the simpler the patterning should be and vice versa at nitty where we've made a couple of additions recently to our style sheet because we've been listening and there's been some really good conversations about yarn substitution recently we're adding as of this issue we're asking designers to include a description of the yarn that they used to help make substitutions and so that will guide you as well. And the description might be some information beyond what's visible in the picture. So information like not only is this a pure wool, as you can see in the yarn, but yarn details, the specification, but this is a woolen spun yarn uh, with lots of, lots of fuzzy texture so that the color work works really well. Or you might see something like this is a really smooth, luxurious yarn that feels really good on the hands different descriptions to help you identify. Last category is quantity. How do you identify the quantity of the yarn that you need? And I've included all of the details here. As I mentioned, there are four different colors for this one. And what you need to do is you need to look at, of course, number of skeins, but you also need to look up the put up, the yardage in that skein. If you're substituting another brand, another brand may not have the same quantity of yarn in that skein and it's important not just to look at weight but it's important to look at length the distance at yards or meters because different fibers weigh different amounts as well so you can have a hundred grams of wool and a hundred grams of cotton but cotton's heavier than wool so there may be less yardage in that so you have to be a little bit careful if you're looking at this here if you're looking at the quantity you're going to be specific your size i just randomly picked the fifth size here your size and what we're, i've circled the numbers for the number of skeins and here it's obvious that there's not a heck of a lot of the carrot used i'm guessing that's the orange one uh, and so it's just one skein across all sizes and the way that you would figure this out is i would get my calculator out and i would multiply so the main color it needs five skeins at 217 yards i'm going to need a uh, 1,085 yards. The other colors, it's one skein each. I want to address a question that comes up specifically here. Yardage listed here in a pattern is an approximation. Okay, We cannot actually tell you exactly, exactly how much yarn you might use because, well, there you may make changes as you go if you work a few extra rounds on the cuff for example that's going to change the yardage against what's specified in the pattern and i don't know about you but i'm very bad at keeping track of the number of rounds in the cuff things can change if your gauge is off by a tiny amount as well and so yeah let's acknowledge you may not match gauge perfectly that's fine so that can change your yardage uh if you're making adjustments on the fly, I'm always making the sleeve shorter because that's just me. Uh, a lot of people lengthen the, lengthen the garments. If you're making changes, that's going to change the yardage requirement. So this is always and forever an approximation. I do see patterns sometimes that give you exactly a specific yardage across different sizes. We're not choosing to take that approach because we are wanting to make sure that as a knitter you've got a buffer you need a buffer for all of these adjustments on the fly frankly you need a buffer because sometimes you find a knot in your yarn or if you're using a variegated yarn sometimes you see colors that you need to adjust uh, um, i don't know about you but my dog has been known to run off with a ball of yarn and chew on it we lose balls things happen right so there's a buffer in this oh and heck yes there's enough for swatching these estimations always include for enough for swatching so these are are over estimations. If you're using up stash yarn and if you're trying to estimate hand spun, for example, there are some clues here. So let's talk about the quantity of MC used. Okay. I've chosen the fifth size here and you can see that the fourth size and the sixth size, they both, those sizes both also call for five skeins. What that's telling me is I'm guessing that I'm not going to get close 
to using up all of that fifth skein. So there's a little bit of room for play. Do you see what I mean? And if we look at CC1 here, the Farwell color, you see how two larger sizes also use a single skein, which tells me that I've, if I've got a little bit less, if I've got 200 yards or even 180 yards, chances are I'm probably going to be okay with that CC1. And then look at CC3. Goodness, there's, you know, there's three larger sizes use the CC1. So again, that's, sorry, CC3. So again, that's a clue that I'm not going to need exactly all of those, that yardage there. So that helps with substitution as well. So just looking at the sizes around. Whereas here, if I was making the this size, okay, I'm going to suspect that I'm going to get pretty close to all of those 217 yards. Again, knowing that a designer is always going to put a little bit of extra in there, a little bit of buffer, and we're always making sure you have enough to swatch. This is why local yarn stores always have a calculator at the front desk. As of this issue, we are making a change on some of the yardage information that if a project uses only a fraction of a skein for a contrast color, for example, we will give a yardage estimation. So in this case, for the carrot, what we're actually going to do is we're going to say it really only uses a tiny, tiny, tiny amount because it may well be that it's a tiny amount and you don't need anything like that. So that's going to help with substitutions. This is also useful if the yarn is particularly spendy expensive uh, and it will help you to use up those leftovers too because something like this it's saying oh, okay 50 yards I'm guessing even though I may go digging in my yarn boxes for the main color and the two contra the two major contrast colors if I only need 50 yards of that orange one there I may even be able to substitute something I already own or something a little bit of hand spun uh, leftovers from another project even heck if it doesn't Ma, there isn't that much yardage. I bet you I could substitute something where the gauge doesn't exactly match either, and it would probably work out okay. So this is what you're going to see in the nitty patterns from here on in. You're going to see where it's a partial skein, where it uses a fraction of the skein. Now, if it was using most of the carrot, we wouldn't bother listing it. We would say one skein, and that's a clue that you're going to get need pretty much all of that but you're going to see additional information about the yardage to help you and also descriptions to help you make good choices because what this yarn information is about and really what knitting patterns are all about they're instructions to make you have a happy project right have a happy result and be pleased with what you've made and be proud of what you made so what we're doing a nitty is helping you be happy with your end result. And we've added this information to make sure that you're able to make better choices and be happy with your projects. And I hope you found that helpful. And I hope that the yarn information that you see there is helping you choose some good stuff to have super projects. And I'm hoping that this information as well has given you a little bit of information to help you be a little bit more powerful a knitter feel a little bit more empowered. Thanks for your time.